Welcome, everybody. My name is Rais Noel. I'm the Global Events Program Lead with Women in Cloud. And in today's session, we have a lot that we're going to cover. We have some incredible speakers joining us today for an exciting uh, panel. We have the Accenture CXO panel, and we are going to start with some opening remarks. There will be um, a conversation uh, with executive women leading the financial services. And then we'll have an opportunity for focused discussions in, um, in breakouts with Accenture leaders. And we also have some Accenture recruiters that will be joining as well. So stay tuned for that. And we have a lot to get to. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, Erin Northern. She is the partnership lead with Women in Cloud. And she's going to you know, set the stage for all we have to experience today. Um, so Erin, over to you. Thank you. Hello and welcome to the Women in Cloud and Accenture CXO series, where we elevate industry conversations to drive collective transformation around cloud employability and leadership topics. I am Erin Northern, Partnerships Lead with Women in Cloud. Our mission is to create a billion dollars in economic access for female tech entrepreneurs in partnership with Fortune 100 brands, corporations, and communities. We focus on three core areas. First, empowering female tech entrepreneurs through access and innovation to foster economic development. Second, building powerful partnerships with Fortune 100 brands, entrepreneurs, and communities to create an inclusive workplace through job representation. And third, driving nonpartisan political advocacy to advance policies that create and retain economic access for women. But as we all know and have experienced, the pandemic has caused an emerging global crisis for women due to many key factors. Let's consider the following research and data. 30 years ago, the computing women workforce was 36%, and in 2019, that has fallen to 27%. This has created a gap of 8 million women in the tech workforce, while other businesses on the planet are becoming a digital business driven by a pandemic. There is an increased displacement of women-held jobs, and according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, due to COVID-19, more than 2.2 million women were unemployed and is estimated 100 so you want to listen? million women's jobs will be eliminated in the next yeah. 20 years as a result of AI transformation. Session. Today, only 3% of corporate procurement dollars and 5% of federal contracts are going to women-owned firms. This situation is made worse by investors reducing their investment in women-led tech companies, taking it to less than 2%. In response to this crisis, Women in Cloud has launched the Fortune 100 initiative. It is a turnkey economic access and equity advancing solution for Fortune 100 companies to come together and collectively solve gender equity challenges through representation, recruitment, and relationship building. When we reached out to Gina Franticangeli from Accenture, she immediately said absolutely yes. So today we are really excited to host the CXO series to help women engage in their executive leadership journeys in tech, learn the power of cloud transformation, and what it means to create economic access and meet the Accenture leadership team. Our strategic partnership with Accenture will focus on three significant economic areas. First, supporting inclusive innovation by attracting diverse talent and creating rapid access to cloud job opportunities quickly and effectively. Secondly, collaborating with Accenture Ventures to create valuable access for mentors and investments to integrate female tech founders into their portfolio. Third, transforming the supply chain in the enterprise markets via co-selling with female tech founders. And lastly, we are working with the Accenture employee ecosystem with more than 500,000 people in 120 countries to advance UN goals around gender inclusion, sustainability, and activating an inclusive infrastructure. This is a bold commitment, and I invite all of you to consider making a personal commitment to creating economic inclusion for women. To become economic catalysts, here are three easy ways to ignite this movement. Request a warm introduction with industry leaders via Get Introduced. Participate in Fortune 100 Lunch and Learn series to learn how to conduct, conduct business with enterprise brands. And submit your job profile and attend our Cloud Jobs Recruitment Lounge at WIC UNGA October 14th from 5 to 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. So now that I've shared this tremendous vision and mission with all of you, I would like to introduce you to my friend and WIC Advisory Board member, Patty Burroughs. 
For over 20 years, Patty has proudly partnered with financial services clients to transform their IT organizations through service and platform modernization. She is responsible, responsible for technology delivery through full uh, financial service clients in the Midwest. She specializes in global delivery services, driving operational excellence through large-scale partnerships and enabling business results through technology transformation. She greatly enjoys being a mentor and career advisor to other women in technology, Accenture Women in Technology, and plays a leadership role in the Women in Cloud organization as well, and sits on our board of advisors for Women in Cloud. She lives in Mundelein with her husband, Robbie, special education teacher at Stevenson High School, and her 16-year-old son, Jude. In her spare time, she enjoys golf, music, spending time with family and friends, and her two active dogs. Welcome, Patty. Erin, hey, thank you so much. I appreciate that nice intro. Um, some staggering metrics that you shared with us earlier. Um, I just want to recognize the impact that you guys are making on these women. The Women in Cloud community overall is just so incredible. Um, the experience, your advice, your passion just really shines through in all that you do. And it's really been a true honor of mine to partner with you this year. Um, I love numbers. So a great testament to the WIC impact is the willingness and outpouring of participation that we've seen specifically from Accenture. So we've had the honor of over 50 appearances at your events just in the short time that we've partnered together. And that's, you know, keynote speakers, panelists, mentors for the founders, industry advisors covering, you know, small group break breakouts on different topics. Um, it's just been staggering, right? Everyone is just more than willing to do anything that they can do to help push your mission. So congrats to you and your team. Um, and just thank you on behalf of women everywhere. You're doing a great job. Um, this particular forum, the CXO forum, as we were kind of figuring out what we could do together and how we can make the best, best impact, we thought, you know, if Accenture can help create a wider reach um, and impact, inviting our strategic clients to participate just grows that reach exponentially, right? So we are thrilled to co-host this series with you. And this one in particular is so exciting for me personally, as I've been in the financial service industry for, uh, you mentioned 20 years, it's actually been almost 25, so about a quarter of a century. And it, throughout all that time, I have yet to see such a major transformation of the industry. So I'm so excited to hear these ladies' stories today and really gather some great advice to take away with me. And I hope the audience all feels the same. So I'd like to invite Amy on stage with me. Hi, Patty. Hi, great. Thanks for so, including me today. Of course, yeah. So this is Amy Janagi. She's my colleague and friend. Um, she is a senior leader in Accenture's Cloud First Practice and also has been supporting FS customers for the majority of her career. Um, she's also very active and passionate around creating opportunities for women within and outside Accenture. And it's my great pleasure to introduce her as our panel facilitator today. So Amy, welcome. Thank you, Patty. I would love it if you could start off by sharing just a few of the ways that you are creating access for women. Sure, thank you. So, you know, as you know, I'm extremely passionate about growing our female talent, specifically at Accenture. Um, it's, it's been my mission over the last few years to recruit, mentor, and grow our next generation of female leaders. And hopefully the, a lot of you on this call will be those someday. Accenture has been a great place for me to build my career, and I've been extremely impressed with Julie Sweet, our CEO, and her commitment and results to building a gender diverse workforce. Outside of Accenture, I've been very proud to be on the National Advisory Council for NPower. NPower believes that well-performing companies are made up of diverse workforces with clear pathways for success for all, including women. That's awesome. I recognize all the things that you're doing within Accenture to drive parity, and it's really exciting to hear about some of your other outside initiatives. So thanks for sharing that. Um, shifting a little bit to the industry focus, can you share with us any of your insights into maybe trends or commonalities that you're seeing within financial services around their transformation agendas or journey to cloud? Sure. So historically, financial services, in, in my mind, has been really a slow adopter to cloud, but really it's all, it's all changing right now. So things are really starting to get interesting. Um, a lot of this technical debt that has you know, really been oppressive within financial services is starting to get removed at an impressive pace, which is allowing us and our businesses to focus on how they can use cloud to grow their business, increase revenue, and really reduce costs. So it's, it's an exciting time to be in cloud, and it's more exciting than ever to be in cloud and FS. I totally agree. Yeah. I mean, it's not easy. There's a lot to unpack there, but with that, a ton of opportunity to leverage the cloud to do things that FS organizations historically just weren't capable of doing. 
right? I mean, data's always been the core of their business, but now they can use mass amounts of data at scale in real time and leverage different types of data that maybe they couldn't effectively use in the past, images, video, things like that, right? So I agree, it's a very exciting time to be in FS and be in FS Cloud. So um, great, thanks for that, Amy. Without further ado, let's get to our main event. I'll give you the floor to introduce our panel and just get things kicked off. Okay, great. So thank you, Patty, and welcome to everyone. I am really pleased to introduce our panel of inspirational women for today's discussion. Let's start with Katinka. Katinka Wallstrom is the president and chief commercial officer of Alight Solutions. In this role, she is responsible for leading all aspects of Alight's commercial organization, including North America sales, strategic accounts, channels, and partnerships and marketing. Prior to joining Alight, Katinka was the leader of Accenture's financial services practice in North America and a member of Accenture's global management committee. As a former colleague of Katinka's, I can tell you she has been inspiring women her entire career, including this woman. Welcome, Katinka. Next, I'd like to introduce Sarah Schmidt. Sarah is the Chief Information Security Officer of Farmers Insurance. In her role, Sarah is able to nurture her passion for women in IT, especially security. Not only did she create the Farmers Women in Cybersecurity Affiliate, but she mentors through the Council of Women in Technology, engages in summer STEM programs for girls, and strives to grow, develop, and encourage women in the IT industry. Welcome to you, Sarah. From the Doctors' Company Group, I'm happy to introduce Deepika Srivastava. Deepika is an SVP, Chief Information Officer, and Chief Information Security Officer at the Doctors' Company Group, the nation's largest physician-owned provider of insurance, risk management, and healthcare practice improvement solutions. Throughout her 17-year tenure with the Doctors' Company, she has built a reputation for developing technology solutions which drive organizational agility, efficiency, and shape business strategy. Deepika is passionate about mentoring emerging women leaders and serves on the advisory board of Michigan State University's actuarial science program. Pretty impressive. Welcome, Deepika. Our final panelist is Michelle Green from Discover Financial Solutions. Michelle is Discover's vice president of financial systems and joined in 2019 to lead their cloud transformation. Michelle is known for developing and leading her teams to produce results and transform organizations by leveraging digital technology and data. Michelle is a technology enthusiast and channels this love into her involvement as a board member and treasurer for Lumity, a not-for-profit organization focused on breaking down barriers to STEM by providing teens and young adults from underserved communities with experiences to prepare them for lifelong STEM careers. Welcome to you, Michelle. Okay, now that the introductions are behind us, Let's hear from you in your own words. I'm going to start with Deepika. Can you go ahead and share how you are leveraging cloud and more importantly, how the work you are doing in cloud is bringing excitement to your organization? Thank you for the wonderful introduction and I'm really happy to be here. So for TDC Group, our cloud transformation is multidimensional. We are engaged in end-to-end -end digital transformation and which in turn is creating a lot of excitement and agility for business. Now, we recently completed two, not one, <laughs> cloud-hosted policy administration systems transformation. It was challenging, but we got through it. And in doing so, we are continuing to build and more and more of our microservices, API-led architecture on the infrastructure side, we're engaging in you know, further strengthening our cloud infrastructure, as well as serverless architecture, just building more on the cloud as far as data is concerned that Patty mentioned, there's so much of data available right now. So figuring out and building our lake architecture in the cloud, federating data sources, data, data, data. So we're working through a lot in our cloud transformation. From an agility and excitement standpoint, TDC at the core services healthcare. And our mission is to make it easier for people who are providing superior healthcare. And in doing so, introducing cloud as a strategy, we're building ways of making them, making and providing easier ways of doing business with TDC. We're committed to creating digital workflows for both our internal and external stakeholders. 
So cloud is really the key to our business strategy. And we have some excitement ahead of us as we build and introduce more and more capabilities. I think we're going to hear about data from everyone. It seems like it's a popular theme today. So that's really exciting, Deepika. Uh, Kantika, could you go ahead and also answer the same question? How are you all leveraging cloud at Alight? And how is it bringing excitement to your organization? Hey, Amy. Uh, well, first of all, I'm really excited to, uh, to be here with all of you. And um, at Alight, we're excited about uh, uh, our purpose to simplify the path to uh, lifelong health and wealth and well-being and to help people with their uh, most important decisions when it truly matters. So we're excited by the opportunity to use our cloud platform to connect the dots between people and work and life and help them navigate health and wealth and well-being decisions. Um, we serve 30 million employees and their families on our cloud platform. Um, our platform allows us to deliver on health, wealth, and um, well-being in a way that is easier and uh, more intuitive and encourage uh, engagement. So the best part of my day, what excites me the most, is hearing from our clients how through our cloud platform and, of course, our people, uh, we have supported them through some really challenging times in the last uh, 18 months. Um, and I know that our cloud platform really helped us respond quickly uh, to the needs that they had. Uh, we developed new solutions and uh, new products really at speed. Uh, for example, within weeks, uh, we launched uh, a light verify, which is a solution that helps employers meet the new COVID requirements. So we are excited to further accelerate uh, and advance products and solutions in the cloud so we can uh, deliver value faster to our clients. So lots going on. It must be so rewarding to work at a company that has such an impact, especially in the last few years. It is That's a really... tremendous purpose. That's great. Michelle, can you go ahead and answer the same question as well? Or how are you leveraging cloud and how is that exciting to your organization? Yep, thanks so much and um, for having me and also for the kind introduction. Um, at Discover, we do have an enterprise-wide cloud strategy, you know, similar to the other panelists. Um, finance is actually an early adopter in this, and we were first out of the gate with our digital finance transformation that started 22 months ago. Um, it's enabled by cloud, and the intention of it is to replace our seven general ledger applications. Um, believe it or not, they're 35 years old on-prem, they have had enhancements over the years, but certainly not to the level needed to move to cloud because they're still heavily customized. So we're actually simplifying our landscape uh, ultimately to three Oracle cloud applications. And to answer your question about the excitement, it's actually building for cloud throughout Discover. Uh, we kicked off 2021 in March with Discover our CIO Amir and our business technology team being recognized as a CIO 100 award winner for our cloud data solution. And this is the same solution that we're actually using as a gateway between our on-prem systems to those Oracle cloud applications for our 74 general ledger feeds. So our con excitement continues to build actually um, because our team is getting closer to go live, which is in 94 days from today. And being part of a digital transformation for, for those who have been part of one is truly an elite experience. And many see this opportunity um, present itself only one time in their career. So to see how our team has grown from where we started at the beginning 22 months ago to where we are today is incredible. And then the other thing I just wanted to add for those who are thinking about doing a cloud transformation, um, before I joined Discover, I had met with the then um, CIO, the then CFO, and the then CAO, um, who have all moved on to other pastures. And each of them actually indicated that Discover did not do large programs well. Um, so I accepted that challenge, joined Discover to help architect the program and, and lead it, and invest in our next generation finance and technology leaders. And I am proud to share that our program team not only has evolved and grown over the last 20 or so months, but we've actually changed the sentence that Discover does do large programs well. 
So we're on time, under budget, with high quality, um, with our diverse team. And we actually did it in one fall swoop from going on-prem to in the cloud in this 20-month um, journey, which, as you guys know, most companies do it in several iterations and a step level to get there. And then we've, we've actually done it with our really strong partners uh, beside us along the way. You know, certainly thrilled to, to be here with Accenture as one of our strong partners and Oracle is our other one. That is one of the most impressive stories I've ever heard of. It's, it's that is incredible. I mean, 35 year old applications, seven general, I mean, it, that's, that is crazy. And the fact that you guys are leading from the front at Discover and doing the hard things to show, you know, how they can be done. So that is, that's really impressive. Um, kudos to you. And I'm hopefully your 94 days will go by really quickly and you'll, you'll be able to celebrate soon. <laughs> okay, Sarah, let's go ahead and turn to you. Um, so can you share a little bit about how you are leveraging cloud and, and how that's bringing excitement to your organization as well? Yeah, absolutely, Amy, and thanks again for inviting me here. Super happy to be here today. And I saw a question come in on the chat already that said, that asked why didn't FS use cloud? And I can't speak on behalf of all of financial services, uh, but Farmers is a little over 100 years old. So to mimic what Michelle was just saying, our technology is old. The technical debt is real. Uh, the resource debt is real um, and, and what that looks like. And so we, you know, we're mid flight in what that journey looks like. And for us, the past couple of years, if you think about how insurance has been sold, traditional insurance has been sold the past couple of years, you walk into an agent's office, you sit down, you have a conversation. Well, that couldn't happen these past couple of years. And so we had to, we had to innovate and we had to think about how do you reach customers when they're sitting on their couch and not across from you at a table. And we really looked to the cloud to be um, to be a value add there and help us to achieve achieve those goals. So while I'm not driving our cloud cloud programs, I'm doing my best to make sure that our you know our definition of four walls has changed uh, when you move to the cloud and protecting that and the data again data data data. That's that's our our life's blood. It's everybody's life's blood in, in financial services. And so ensuring we have the right controls around that. Um, I tell you, my team is incredibly excited to be a part of this journey because from a cloud perspective, I think for the first time we're at the table from, from the initiation, we're a part of the conversation for security. Um, and it's going to be, it already is a really, really exciting, a really engaging uh, effort for all the farmers. That's great. And I, I love how you're showing that security can help enable the transfer nation transformation, but not block it because a lot of people see it as an inhibitor, but you're actually enabling. And, and I, I think that's that's really fascinating. Thanks, Sarah. Okay, so let's move on here. All of you women play very different roles within your organization around your cloud journey. Some driving the strategy, some enabling it. Katinka, how is Alight leveraging the cloud and data to drive differentiated business outcomes? Yeah, thanks, Amy. Um, I think as already mentioned in the beginning, uh, employees today are facing real challenges um, related to their health, rising healthcare costs, financial well-being, and the pandemic put all this into sharper focus. And the employers uh, in turn had to, in a very short period of time, figure out how to move large portions of their workforce uh, to work from home. And for those who could not work from home, how to protect them, how to keep them safe, how to focus on well-being. And as employers look to increase productivity and profitability and attract critical, critical talent, employees uh, needed greater flexibility and support. So it's all very complex. And um, to us, and I know for everyone here on the call, it became evident that companies that were more digital, that had more of their applications in the cloud, they were able to move much faster, both in terms of business models and also in terms of people models. Um, so as we look ahead, uh, I would argue that the best run cloud strategies, they bring all of these things together. Cloud strategies, data, automation, machine learning, cognitive AI, we've heard a lot about uh, this this afternoon. And, of course, to make things more efficient, but also to help with decision making, um, to detect opportunities and also to predict where there might be issues. And that is the journey that we're on uh, at Alight to really drive those differentiated business outcomes. 
uh, we believe that there's an incredible, incredible opportunity for companies to increase employee engagement and create more personalized experiences through better use of data. We're going to talk about data, I suspect, a lot today. So for our clients, we're using machine learning to better understand and scan massive volumes of data to find patterns that were perhaps missed before and to help clients produce better health and wealth programs for their employees. Um, one example that I think we can all uh, think about for ourselves and our families is you know, machine learning for claims data. Um, Claims arrive in many different forms uh, for weeks and months on end sometimes from the doctor, the nurse, the facilities, pharmacy, x-ray, uh, you name it. So how much did that broken arm actually cost? It's very hard to know. So machine learning helps find the patterns and can assemble information. It can forecast the missing claims or the missing information. So the opportunities are truly uh, endless in the use of uh, this technology, certainly in our industry, but really every industry. That, that's really interesting, Katinka. So now we've added uh, machine learning to our buzzwords for the day. So hopefully we'll learn a little bit more about that as we go on and let's see what else we can pick up. Okay, Sarah, you have a unique role to protect the organization amid all this digital transformation. Can you share some ways you and your team have had to adjust given the level of change that's currently underway? Great question, Amy, and I'll tell you, I've been in the information security space for 20 years now, and um, it did not fully prepare me to our journey to the cloud. It's different. It's just different. You know, your on-prem mentality and what you have, you know, how we used to protect data, protect servers, protect devices, um, when you owned a data center looks a lot different than it, when it's in the cloud. And so it's been really exciting to say, okay, let's learn anew, right? We're all learners here. That's why we're in the tech space to begin with. And so we have had the opportunity to say, okay, we did firewalls like this before, but what does, what does it look like in the cloud? Our toolkit looks different. Um, and one of the biggest benefits of cloud is that flexibility to move up and down very quickly. And our traditional security mindset did not allow for that. Um, we had been you know, a roadblock or a barrier in the past and now we had to kind of re, you know, re-educate ourselves, re-educate our team on how do we put the right guardrails in place, develop the right platform so that our business partners and our IT partners could come in and operate independently. And I knew that they would do it in a way that was secure for the organization. I didn't have to watch over their shoulder. I gave them the freedom uh, to do what they needed to do, but in a way that I felt secured the organization. And that's never how we've approached security before and so it has been an adjustment. It's been, you know, it's been exciting. It's been new. Um, lots, even terminology is different. All of it is is just different. Um, and I'll tell you, it has been. I think one of the one of my most favorite parts of my career because again, it's like starting all over um, with the opportunity to learn and to grow and to educate yourself on a whole variety, a whole new field, nearly. I like how um, you were discussing about flexibility. So I'm sure that five years ago, you thought you're flexible, but you have like a whole new definition of flexible right now. It's completely had to change over time. So that, that's really interesting. Thank you. Uh, Michelle, can you share a couple of things you put into place that have been, a, been beneficial to your organization's journey? I know we've talked about all the success that you're having right now. I mean, how did you set yourself up for success from the very beginning? Michelle, are you, can you hear me? I'm so sorry. The one moment in this hour that the doorbell rings and the door. Oh my goodness, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's real life right there. It is. Um, welcome to working from home during shelter in place. Um, to answer your question, and I love the, um, the comment that you just made a minute ago about the last five years. It seems like the last five years, it actually seems like it's 25 years ago with as much technology advancement that's happened. And I would say, you know, the keys to our access, and I think this was one of the items that popped up in the chat too, is, you know, our diverse team, you know, honoring the enterprise culture shifts that I think a few folks have talked about, you know, having our transparent program governance in place 
And then the ones that I wanted to talk about, you know, for this conversation are just really addressing our unique cloud considerations early. Um, we actually did a four month data requirements and cloud assessment up front that just paid dividends for us. You know, Sarah talks a lot about the security. We've talked about data. Some of the things that we found when we did our assessment, our scope for that was the data requirements, our integration between our cloud applications with our on-prem landscape that's still gonna be in place. And then what our cloud data solution needed to be to ultimately support those applications. And what we found was clearly security is um, foremost. And so we had to do two things for our finance data requirements. The first of which we needed to tokenize our data so that one, it's safe in the cloud, but then also our end users were able to use it for financial reporting and reconciliation purposes with ease. And then the second, which um, we haven't touched on here, but I do wanna share with the audience that this is a significant level of effort in moving to the cloud, which is if your organization is gonna to go to the cloud, think about establishing your enterprise data standards upfront because our organization was already going through that process. And so we ended up having to inventory um, all of our general ledger finance fees that produce our financial statements and reg reports. And this was a big level of effort to inventory the thousands of data attributes and their related calculations and document that data lineage from the reports all the way to the source systems. So definitely don't undermine that level of effort. And then the third thing that I would say is, um, we also had a forward-looking perspective on what it's going to take to maintain these applications. So the first thing that we um, went in with our guiding principle and actually our, our now CIO and CFO said, if you guys want to do any customizations in the cloud, you will require our blood signatures to do that. So we actually have no customization at all in our Oracle Cloud applications. And this actually helped us in a number of ways throughout our program in the last year which is our training standard for our end users and our product team that's just forming. And then the second thing is standard is helping us figure out what we can leverage from our program to use in our future state to maintain the applications in those monthly and quarterly updates. Um, so for example, automated testing, so that you're not doing a ton of you know, manual testing and putting that burden on your end users or your product team. And then lastly, and I think Sarah was touching on this a little bit, um, as well as Kathika is around um, the hardest change of all, which is the culture shifts. You know, so for us, um, some of these culture shifts that I'm gonna talk about are unnatural for Discover and they're also unnatural for our individuals because people have been behaving in the ways that they have been for 35 years. Discover is an organization that has a long tenure. And so our future state product team actually has a blended finance and, and IT, or we call them BT for business technology. And IT is now our business partner. For the last 35 years, they've been an order taker. So this program has forced that thinking throughout our organization. So we're going to be going forward, making architecture and functionality decisions together. The second thing that our transformation opened the door on is allowing our finance end users to have a bigger voice. And, and that's something they haven't had before either. And, and so when we're really thinking through what does our stakeholder network need to look like for each of the applications, how are we going to engage with them for those monthly and quarterly updates to understand what the releases are? How is that going to change their jobs? Help make us uh, help us make the decision of when the right time to turn that functionality on because Oracle or your ultimately your cloud provider is going to give you a time frame to which the functionality needs to be adopted. And then last but not least, I'd say that um, please don't think that cloud is a one and done. So our organization, it's not just a one-time implementation and then you can put it to bed and you know celebrate with all the fanfare and the, the success. It's actually more than that. You know, for us, it's going to be a continuous improvement mindset, which Discover is really great at anyway. We don't think that way, though, in terms of finance technology. So these monthly and quarterly updates are going to force us to how can we constantly improve, adopt new functionality, what has to change in our processes, our controls, our reports, our data, people's ways of working. And then um, certainly 
continue to forge the strong partnerships that we have with Accenture and Oracle in place right now so that we can stay informed of what innovation is coming up as well as what these updates are going to include and how we want to um, address them. That's really, that's really fascinating. I, two things that I wanted to call out, just, just one really quick question. How long did it take you to do this data lineage and the, the data effort that you, that you talked about? Yep, it started in that first four month tranche. So we started like February to May on the assessment, but then the rest of the data lineage continued through the end of last year. So I would wow. say, you know, nine months in total. Okay. And so, then as our organization is thinking about doing the same thing for the other areas, such as FPNA or our loss forecasting group, we've been estimating six to nine months, depending upon the number of data attributes and calculations that they want to trace back. Okay. So a lot of prep work went into that. And then also, I really liked your point about no customizations, and then you have to do that in blood. I mean, that. <laughs> If every client would do that, it would make things so much more standard and really, um, you know, predictable. So I think that's great advice, and I think that's awesome that you had support of your leadership to be able to implement that. Yeah, I would. I would actually thank um, Chris Johnston, the MD from Accenture. He said that when we were doing orals, he said, "Stay vanilla, adopt vanilla. It's going to make everything easier all the way throughout." So we listened. That's great. Okay, Deepika, what are some cha- some key challenges you have had to overcome, such as organizational or technical, on your journey to the cloud? So like Sarah mentioned, we're in insurance, and insurance is one of the oldest industries in the world. We're notoriously antiquated for many of our practices, like meeting with our clients in person. Try still, there are still some agents walking around getting a vet signature on a form, and that cannot be done within the digital age that we're in. So I truly believe the insurance industry will operate differently in the next 10 years. We, we have to, the change and the disruption the massive volumes of data and processing is driving us towards that. But as far as challenges are concerned, organization change management. Why are we going on this cloud transformation? It really is important when you're trying to make your partners and your business partners, your leadership teams understand why we need to invest. There's a lot of talk about cloud transformation, but at the executive round table, having a clear story to tell. And as women who are leading these initiatives, I think it's becoming even more important storytelling, igniting that flywheel of change. So IT software is expensive. Any cloud transformation, any projects you take is expensive and a business has to make a decision. Am I going to invest in this or am I going to invest in a different business strategy? So backing into it, it's the change management, it's other ladies in, in this panel have touched upon it, but the why is important, making sure you have a story that has a clear beginning, a good middle, and a great end. And middle becomes really important when you're in the middle of the execution phase, because you're going to have multiple systems. You're going to have processes that you're supporting, which are not completely automated. You're going to have frustrated customers who, you know, they're they're just frustrated. They don't want to be in two systems. So making sure that you can remind them of the context, the why around what we're doing um, really help. The other challenge I would say is time to market. We're in this Amazon delivery product mode, right? If I'm a business executive and I sit down or a customer because we serve some large health systems, large hospitals, I order something on Amazon, it gets delivered on my doorstep next day. Now we're all IT professionals, doesn't work that way. There's nothing that gets delivered on your doorstep that you can open and oh look, it works for us. So setting the right expectations really helps us uh, sort of manage the delivery cadence or else it's why isn't it done? And then just unwinding the spaghetti is difficult. So really having the change plan We've been doing some things for so long that to automate and to change, it takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of reminding as to why it's important. So I would say from a challenge standpoint, that's you know, those are some of the few things that come to mind. It is also important to select not just the right technology, but how you're going to scale it. Um, and again, having a clear vision really helps with that. I think that's really 
really important. And I also really like the point about setting clear expectations. So a lot of times, you know, I work with organizations who think that cloud is a silver bullet. So I'm going to implement cloud and then I'm going to have like all this amazing stuff happen to me. But, you know, that's not that easy. You have to put the right operating model in place. You have to put the right checks and balances, the right security, understand how you're going to access the data. Like all of that stuff is really important. So you, you want to make sure that it's not people understand that you're working on this massive journey. Um, the other thing I was I was just laughing to myself, I was just telling someone the other day that you almost have to take a marketing class to be able to sell cloud to your organization because you really, you, your storytelling is so important. You need to help them see where they're going to get to, at, you know, at the, you know, at this final destination. And, and, you know, as Michelle said, it's actually not final because you have to completely iterate as you keep going. So thank you. Okay, so Michelle and Sarah, as leaders in your industry, what do you want to be known for? This is a good question. I can start. So two things I would say. Um, uh, one, as, as a security team, so, so within the organization, um, we have always had, security has traditionally had that uh, department of no mentality, right? Don't you ask the security team only if you have to, and they're probably gonna say no. And if you could just get away with not talking to them, that would be for the best. So number one goal is to change that mentality. And we've been on this journey for years now, and I, it is changing. And I feel it. I feel support all the way from the top of my organization. And to be invited to groups like this where security, even, you know, I'm at, I'm at this table, which is not, which always hasn't been the case for the past past you know 10 years or so um, and so I think that's a big thing that I work on is just to, to be how is security an enabler how are we making your project your effort your initiative more successful how are we even being a differentiator uh, for the organization right knowing that being on the front page of the newspaper is a very bad day for many organizations and so how can I do my part to to ensure that that doesn't happen um, for us because that will become you know you will customers will decide to not do business with certain organizations if they don't have a great security posture. I, I sense that coming. Um, so that's a big part is to, you know, kind of have security, be at the table, be, be an enabler, be a part of the conversation and be a welcome participant. Um, and then more personally, uh, I really want to be the behind the scenes, someone that's grown the next generation. I have had amazing women that helped guide me to, to where I am right now. And I want to do that for the women on my team, for the women I mentor, for all of the women in technology, if I can individually meet every single one of them. Um, I think it's really important that that I play a role, that I give back in this space, that I ensure that that women and young girls, I have two, two girls that they have role models to look up to in this space that they have someone that they can model themselves after. Um, so those are my two, my two main goals. Thanks, Sarah. What about you, Michelle? What would you like to be known for? Sarah, I love your answer. Um, and the, um, I guess the short answer for me is I'd love to be known for somebody that has taught the next generation of leaders how to do technology implementations and large programs the right way um, is a, a big one for me. And then also helping people embrace technology so that they can use it, get home to their families faster. You know, that has been such a joy for me over the last particularly 20 years to be able to see those light bulbs go off. Um, in people's minds of what do you mean I don't have to move this paper around the organization or I don't have to manage my workflow through an email or what do you mean I don't have to print a 50 page report to get that one number that I can now double click on and drill into the transactional information. You know, and, and then I would probably give a part two to my answer too because I know that we have a varied audience here from entrepreneurs to um, folks in the you know, Fortune 100, as well as people at varying levels. And my answer would not have been the same, I think, in earlier stages of my career. You know, I think at the beginning of my career, I wanted to be seen as somebody that was either technically savvy, that also helped people, as well as somebody that might have been that go-to person for subject matter expertise. And then mid-career, my legacy statement, if you will, um, would have been somebody that was leading large teams to make positive 
impacts or results for companies so that they could, you know, expand market share or that they could have better cost management principles. And, and so now, you know, there's a, um, a biblical passage of, in Esther about the older, mature woman helping the next generation of leaders. And, and that's really what I want to grow into as I look at the, the next 10 years. Thanks, Michelle. Okay, Katinka and Deepika, let's discuss who influenced you along the way. Can you uh, highlight some key mentors and sponsors that impacted your journey and how? Do you want me to start, Amy? Please. Yeah, please. Okay. Um, question, because there are so message that you made many mentors and sponsors along the way. And as you develop and progress, you need new perspectives and uh, different views. Um, if you're asking me to pick one person, which I think you are, uh, I would mention Dina Dublon uh, because she is, uh, she's been such an amazing mentor to so many of us. I'm sure that there are literally hundreds of women out there that would agree with me. Um, I first got to know Dina when she was my client. Uh, she was the CFO at JP Morgan, and then later she became uh, a board director at Accenture and many other organizations. And she's also a tremendous force in the community. Um, Global Fund for Women, Women's Refugee Organization. She was one of the first women on the trading floor. Uh, and uh, she would, uh, when I sat down and I would ask her for advice, she would always, always push me to think about, you know, if I had an idea about a role, she would say, no, 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 no. There is like 13 other ones that you should think about. So she always pushed me to, to think bigger. And she really mentored everyone the same way. It didn't matter that she was actually a client of mine at one point, and then she was a director. Um, she really saw it uh, and still sees it as her mission to mentor the next generation uh, women. So an amazing, uh, amazing mentor and uh, amazingly balanced to across career, life, community, um, family, all of that. Um, in highlighting Dina, um, I would say though that, um, you, you know, you, you might listen to my story and say, well, that's really lucky that you, you got to um, be mentored by someone uh, so senior, such a senior woman. And I am absolutely extremely lucky. Um, but I would also say I spent most of my career in financial services, which is uh, and certainly in the early days was heavily male dominated. So most of my mentors were actually men and uh, you all know who you are if you're listening um, and uh, they were incredible too. So my advice would be not to get too caught up uh, with finding someone that looks and sounds exactly like you and has exactly your experience. That, that's great feedback. What about you Deepika? You know, um, Great advice there. And, you know, like Katinka, I've been really lucky. I've had some key mentors, sponsors, the allies that have helped me get where I am today. Uh, you know, starting in my very early years, my mom, she's a strong Indian woman and I grew up in India and she always encouraged me. She would always say, break the unwritten rules for women in society and workplace. Uh, you know, they are there and you have to figure out how to break them some great advice, particularly as I've started navigating and working through my uh, career, um, then manager, a friend for life now. And she gave me some really interesting advice in one of our just one on one meetings. And she said, assumptions are problematic. And as I was thinking about this, um, often women, we have the right qualifications and we have the personal readiness to take on that next job, especially early in our career um, or a promotion. And assumptions are made about us, right? She's too nice. She may not want that job or she has a young family. You know, this new job would require a lot of travel. How would she manage that? Or she don't, she, you know, she doesn't want the promotion because she'll have to relocate. And all of those are fine. It is us who we should be making those decisions, not unspoken assumptions in a room someplace deciding. So, you know, that really stayed with me. And I try to encourage as I'm working with um, other women and 
people I'm mentoring to say, let's make sure that there are no assumptions about you. Uh, but I truly believe that some good mentors, sponsors, like I think I said, I've had a variety of them. And, and a lot of them are men who've helped me get where I am today. So building a relationship, a network that can help you because you need them for different things at different times in your career is really important. I definitely wrote that down because I'm going to use that with some of the women that I mentor. Assumptions are problematic. So that's yeah, great advice. That was with me. <laughs> okay, so we just have time for a couple more questions. And Deepak, I'm going to I'm going to stay with you for this one. As your organization pivoted towards adopting the cloud, what key actions did you drive for successful implementation and adop adoption? You know, we've touched upon a lot of them, but I'll try to be quick in this is I will continue to say develop a strong business case for cloud. You really have to have your multi-year roadmap, your financial investments sort of figured out at the beginning, putting customer first as to why we're doing this. Uh, partnering with the right partners, you can leap, you know, as an organization, we were able to leapfrog because we had Accenture as a partner in one of our implementations. So, you know, bringing the right partners on so you could do things quicker and learn from other experiences really help. Um, Sarah has pointed on security for cloud, cybersecurity. I, I manage the security for TDC group. It's a big risk we all live with and engaging the right teams early on and architecting the right solutions uh, is really important. And last, I would say, build time in your plan. Uh, take the time <laughs> because, you know, just Turning it on overnight, it's not going to happen. We take years, you know, to Sarah's example, 35 years for Discover. Your processes have been set. To change them, it will take time. To redevelop your applications will take time. To introduce new business processes will take time. So it's important to make sure that your plan has accounting for work that needs to be done as you're developing applications. And finally, I would end with talent. It is a top priority. None of the work we want to do can be done without talent. So we're in this discussing and you have more opportunity after this from a recruitment standpoint, but talent is a priority for us. Maintaining and attracting good people is key to success. Okay, great. And then I'm just gonna do one more wrap up question before we, we break into the, the breakouts. Um, Sarah, Michelle, or Tinka, would you have any advice to women who are trying to break into the cloud space and you know, how, how, you know, what would they need to do in order to really make an impact in, within cloud? Amy, I'm, I'm happy to start. Um, I guess what I would say is, how could you not consider uh, a career in technology and cloud right now? Uh, so that would be my, my, my first uh, comment. Um, every business is a tech business today. So don't assume that you're going to sit at a desk coding all day. Um, whether you dream of working for the Red Cross or Tesla or the World Bank, uh, everyone needs a technologist. So, so, so keep that in mind. Um, every company is a tech company. Um, it can be a great and you know, pretty flexible um, career too. If you think about a lot of the companies, tech companies, even pre-pandemic, they offered quite flexible hours, uh, flexible locations, all that. Um, so it's a great career if you want to balance life and interests and family and, and all of that. And from an educational perspective, a lot of companies today are hiring technologists that don't have the traditional four-year career. They're hiring, that, hiring them because of specific talents and, and skills that they have. And you know, it is one of the fastest growing industries. And I always think it's good to be in a place that is growing fast. Perfect, thank, thank you. you. If, I, if I can, Amy, I'd love to Go add on to that. Because um, I think one thing that that she's, she mentioned was fantastic. There is a space in technology for anybody, whether, you know, we kind of joked earlier about you need a marketing degree. We hire people with marketing degrees because communication, IT communication is important. Change management is important. There is a space for whatever background, whatever skills you have, we can find the right fit for that in technology. Um, and so I think it's fantastic to know that you don't have to have a four-year IT degree. Whatever you're good at, we can make use of that in technology, especially in the cloud. Yep. And maybe just a quick closing thought on that is, um, Sarah, I loved what you said earlier about 
um, continuous learning. You know, that is what cloud is. And I think one of the main messages that we've all shared today is that cloud is a community. And, and I would add with that continuous learning mindset that you have, don't expect yourself to be perfect. We're all learning together. We're all figuring it out. And, you know, my finance lead on the program has a quote that I have to pay him royalties for all the time. And I love how he says it. It's if you have a problem and you don't say anything, it's your problem. If you share it, it becomes our problem. And just as I've been exposed to the cloud for the last you know, three years, it's new. We are all learning this together. So we need everybody's ideas. That's great. Thank you for that incredible quote. And we can pay royalties to your colleague, but um, it's a great way to end this session and this panel. So ladies, it's been my pleasure to get to know you a little bit better today and to discuss some of your um, career journey. And thank you for sharing it with the audience.